sometimes I'm uh, in a way kind of scared and daunted by how simple the free energy principle is and in, in how it explains the world. Um, so what would you say it says about free will and determinism uh, and agency? Um, like you mentioned there, planning seems to make things a bit more complicated because now suddenly our action and perception is like there's some disconnect and we're needing to make more longer term models and predictions. But yeah, anyway. Yeah, but I think that's a very important observation. You know, the, the notion of making longer term predictions is quite crucial because, you know, that equips your generative model with a temporal depth which most artifacts don't have. I mean, the moon doesn't have it. The weather doesn't have that temporal depth. Um, very small things don't have that temporal depth. You know, any given cell in your, in, your, in your brain wouldn't have that temporal depth. But at a certain scale and a certain size of things, then you do find these quite remarkable um, world models or things look as if they are behaving under a remarkable world model or generative model that can look quite deep into the future. Um, you know, deciding which university to go to, you know, well, um, and, um, you know, if you're a physiologist, you're now in a position of being able to suspend your homeostasis and engage what some people refer to as allostasis. So this is the, the notion that instead of, you know, for example, um, if I was feeling cold, I could engage without any, without any planning, um, all the reflexive actions that would minimize the prediction error induced by thermo uh, receptors registering a surprising um, temperature. And I could start shivering, I could engage uh, pile erection, my hairs might stand on end, um, um, I could divert the blood from my skin into the internal organs, I could reflexively in the moment do the kinds of things that are going to attenuate that um, um, thermoreceptive uh, prediction error. But if I can plan, then as soon as I start to feel cold, I can just go indoors, put a coat on, or um, put, um, put the radiator on. Um, now notice what I, in, in doing that, because I've been able to plan into the future, I now do not have to engage my shivering and my sort of autonomic responses to being an extremist. So I have eluded those surprising states that would normally induce a homeostatic response and, and become much more allostatic. So this is a much more, if you like, sophisticated, more complicated way um, of maintaining my characteristic states, which allow me to suspend a homeostatic reflexive response uh, simply because I got this deep temporal or temporal depth to my to my generative models that usually comes uh, hand in hand with having a hierarchical or a um, a deep uh, a deep generative model. So I think this notion of looking far into the future is quite crucial. Um, and, you know, it really does distinguish, um, you know, sen perhaps you could you could say that, you know, there are different kinds of sentient behavior and, uh, and the kind of um, uh, behavior that comes along with the ability to plan, I think, is qualitatively quite different. It lends us a temporal thickness to, you know, to what's going on. Um, you, you, were, you were trying to uh, persuade me to talk about free will, uh, which, yes. is, uh, which I don't know if I should. Um, so you, th that's a bit, a, a bit too much like philosophy. Um, mm. And, and, and I, you know, you're always in danger of upsetting somebody when you wax lyrical as, as uh, somebody with no formal training in philosophy about free will. Um, I'll say very briefly that um, I, I, in virtue of this autonomy, that we talked about that is characteristic of biological systems, then mathematically, um, I think you're quite licensed to talk about free will, if free will is just the fact that it is self-determined. Um, there are people who argue that's not good enough. There are people who argue it has to be, uh, free will has to um, encompass counterfactual other ways of doing things. So you have to have a choice, as it were, that you could have done this or this or this, but you actually did that um, or that you will do that. So free will thus defined again in a very not philosophically naive way. But, um, um, would I think only be um, found in creatures that plan or systems that plan mm -hmm. quite simply because the the planning is actually or depends upon 
um, rolling out into the future, uh, a counterfactual future that has not yet happened. And then you select um, the particular plan of action or narrative or policy that has the, the least expected free energy or the least expected surprise. There's a lovely story about what that would look like and what that means but for the moment. That, I think the key thing is that you do have a notion of selecting amongst counterfactual futures if you have the kind of generative model that can actually roll out into the future. And of course, we've just said that that's a special kind of generative model and it's only those uh, that kind of model. Uh, um, you'll only find that kind of model in, in systems that can plan and they have this sort of special but relatively simple uh, um, aspect that they represent their own actions as latent causes of their sensations. You've talked there about planning and being able to have generative models, but also to, to look at our models and our plans and select the best course of action. So I'm wondering if the free energy principle says anything about our experience of uh, consciousness or self-consciousness, um, uh, the experience and, uh, and what these mean uh, in, in via thinking in, this, in these terms. Right, you really don't want to do philosophy. Don't you? <laughs> I was talking to a philosopher to yesterday, so it's in my mind. Right. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm not a philosopher, but I got lots of friends who are excellent philosophers. So, but, so I, again, I apologise for the naivety of, of um, the answers, just in case any of them are, are ever uh, uh, watching this. Um, so first of all, the free energy principle uh, is not a theory of consciousness, um, and um, and so you know you would have to work quite hard to apply the free energy to questions of consciousness. People do do that, and they do it in many many different ways. Um, um, and you know, I I will list a couple of them, but with apologies to the approaches which uh, you know, um, uh, that I'm omitting here. So. Um, you know, the first thing um, that you could you could bring to the table is that um, to be conscious, um, you have to be an agent. Um, so you have to be um, um, active. You have to uh, um, have in mind agency. And of course, in order to have agency, you have to have the ability to plan as an agent. So we come exactly back to what we're saying before that. There are certain um, natural kinds that, are, that have uh, generative models that look into the future and come to plan. At the same time, they become agents, and I think that will now become a necessary condition for consciousness. Is that in and of itself um, sufficient to explain selfhood? I think not. I think that the answer would lie in not in the free energy principle, but the generative model to which you would apply the free energy principle. So I think what you're talking about now is a more sophisticated kind of generative model that has a metacognitive aspect, that has a hierarchical depth now, that looks at, looks at its own machinations and can act upon its own belief updating and specifically will entertain um, hypotheses as part of its generative model that can be read in the following way that I can be in this state or this state or this state and I have to recognize what kind of state I am in. So um, so I could be um, in this context I could be an interviewee to, doing a podcast, I could in another context be um, doing the gardening, I could be very embarrassed, I could be very frightened, I could be in love. All of these different states of being are now recognizable hypotheses that contextualize the kinds of things I predict myself to do, and indeed under the free energy principle or active inference as we call it, um, then I will do those things in the, in the in a way that is contextualized appropriately. But look at what we've just said though. We've now got a generative model that represents beliefs of the, of the sort, I am in this state. And just by saying that, then you now have equipped this generative model with a certain kind of selfhood because it's I and it's me doing things. It's me as an agent 
I am embarrassed in this discourse. I am um, about to do this uh, mowing of the lawn uh, when, when I am a gardener. Um, it's all about me as an agent. So if I can recognize that I am an agent and I can um, uh, have a sufficiently fine grained um, model of the different kinds of agency that I would deploy in this context, then I will now have that kind of hierarchical depth, I think, that could indeed support, would be necessary for um, consciousness of, you know, of the sort that I recognize I am. Whether I would be able to talk about it propositionally is another question. You might have another level on top of that, and some people indeed argue that you should. But certainly, it would uh, there will be a minimal selfhood there and it would be evident evident both in terms of my overt actions because i'm now predicting myself to behave in a, in a context sensitive or specific fashion and you will be able to see that in me um, but also i will have internal actions covert actions i will be attending to different things um, i will be um, uh, selecting different kinds of prior beliefs that are appropriate uh, or fit for purpose for this particular context or the way that I'm currently feeling if these were valenced or emotional um, um, uh, inferences ab about myself. So you know, perhaps a simple example of that would just be, you know, how can I feel frightened? How can, you know, if I can be frightened, what does that mean um, about how expressive my generative model is? Um, and why would I ever want to um, um, have that kind of expressive model? Well, if I had the hypothesis that I am something and that I am frightened, then that would explain and thereby provide apt predictions and thereby minimize surprise or free energy. Certain situations, situations, for example, um, where my vision was reporting I, it was dark and there are lots of shadows I cannot identify. Um, other kinds of signals were re reporting um, a racing heart. Uh, other signals would be reporting um, a, a certain muscular rigidity. Um, all the sort of um, interoceptive, proprioceptive and extraceptive signals that one would normally associate with being in a, a, a state of um, you know, fright and flight or, or being in fear. And of course, I am in the moment, uh, you know, at the same time that I am recognizing this constellation of sensory inputs that now I can make sense of with this one simple hypothesis. Oh, I am a thing and I am frightened. And of course, in so doing, I now have predictions about how I will be um, uh, behaving both autonomically and attending internally um, and um, materially in terms of a fright and flight um, uh, kind of uh, motor preparation. And I am now going to be causing the very signals I'm trying to explain. So again, we come back to this wonderful circular causality that you know we're making sense of signals, but we are actually deciding and planning which signals to actually uh, solicit and attend to and to, go, and to go and sample. So that I think would be a minimal requirement to start to get you know even a minimal selfhood out of a generative model. Would that allow you to talk about philosophy? and quality of experience and qualia, probably not. You probably have to go to another level on top of that.